All right, thank you very much. Appreciate the invite and uh, we'd love to be out there next year in, in person. So I'll give you just a quick background of myself and the topic I'd like to cover today. It's, uh, it is, I think, pertinent to the investor group. I wanna make this as interactive and conversation as, conversational as possible. Um, as you said, Mike, my, my background, I began my career on Wall Street in the, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, working for Lehman Brothers and a group called Financial Engineering which was a fixed income trading group that did a lot of analytics on portfolios for our corporate banking clients and just how to optimize their exposure to currencies and interest rates using swaps and derivatives and all kinds of, all kinds of super interesting stuff there. Um, went to, uh, went to law school at, at Harvard at coming out of that joined my friend, Peter Thiel and PayPal and had a 10 year run at PayPal and have been in like tech and finance ever since with jobs, including running finance for PayPal and North eBay's North America business and a couple of later stage CFO jobs. And I was just at HBS at the business school at Harvard last week, giving a, a lecture on this topic. And a lot of the students had the most important question they were asking is, what do you think about 2023 and, and beyond? And these are folks who I think like most in your audience, probably in their you know, late twenties, early thirties, mid thirties, and have experienced a certain type of market that, all of a sudden in 2022 wasn't happening anymore. So question is, how do you, how do you think about lessons in the past and what's portfolio allocation? Where do we invest in now on a go forward basis? Do those lessons still make sense in 2023 and beyond? And I think there are, there are pertinent lessons from the last couple of years that we can take forward in terms of thinking about portfolio allocation and, and how to manage your, your investments. And you got to be thoughtful about that recent history, but also the last couple of years have been, um, you know, a significant break from the prior decade or so, and you can look to other periods in history for some information and and uh, insights as to what what drives returns on a in the new era. So let me just start with what where we're at now and what some of the recent government actions are that have put us in a uh, in, in as to your your point, Mike, just an unusual 2022. So the federal government has done a couple of things over the last couple of years that, um, second here. let me see if I can uh, just go full screen. That might help with the, getting everyone to read it. Okay, so over the last couple of years, we've seen, you've probably heard from officials around the world that we're living in unprecedented times, right? That's come up over and over and over again with respect to the pandemic. Well. As far as pandemics go, it's not exactly unprecedented to be living through a pandemic. We had one in 1969, had one in 1958, had one in 1918. Um, many of you remember the HIV AIDS pandemic from the 1980s. We had cholera outbreaks in the 1800s, I mean, so on and so on and so forth. But what is what was unprecedented was the government response to this pandemic. They did a couple of things that have actually had never done, never done before. The first thing was on the left-hand side is the federal government ran a, a fiscal deficit a stimulus package that was truly unprecedented in its size and scope, with only maybe one exception, the um, World War II deficit. On the left-hand side, you can see that in World War II, the US ran a federal deficit of about 25% of GDP. Ever since then, they were running two and 3% federal deficits and had actually got to a point of balancing the budget as late as 2000, 2001. And in the last couple of years, they've now run fiscal deficits of 12 to 15%, almost the almost the greatest of all time, the GOAT deficits, the Tom Brady of all deficits in the last couple of years. Uh, I, I know you're in Florida. You don't want to hear about Tom Brady. You want to hear about, I don't know, Dan Marino or somebody. It's the Dan Marino <laughs> deficit in the last couple of years. And then they followed that up in the most recent year when the pandemic was effectively over with another almost greatest of all time deficit. Now, had the government only run those deficits and done what it normally does, like borrow money from the private sector to reallocate money and, um, and move money from one pocket to another, that probably wouldn't have had a huge impact on inflation and the broader economy. They didn't do that. The Federal Reserve on the right-hand side was complicit in this process and actually bought those new treasury securities and put them on their balance sheet. Now, the Fed does this all the time. That's how they print money and, and create money in the money supply. So there's always a little bit of debt on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. Back in 2006 and seven, it was around a trillion dollars, a little bit less normal course of Fed operations, right? In the last recession, they took a novel approach and they said, let's just buy these treasury securities and in a much bigger scope and scale than we've ever done before, not simply for the creation of money, but actually create liquidity in the financial system, which at the time was 
um, imperiled by just assets that were distressed. And they took their balance sheet from around one to three trillion and then kind of held it there and, and gently increased it to four trillion in the next couple of years. And then kind of stabilized and hung out and it seemed like that worked reasonably well to increase economic growth and get us through the, the last recession. Inflation wasn't a factor. It seemed like, you know, economic growth was fine. Maybe, maybe we got through that, that financial experiment without any real damage. So this time around, what do they do? They took the same playbook and they just tripled everything. They took the balance sheet from three trillion to about nine trillion. And, and they did that in order to finance those deficits and created a lot of money. And lo and behold, now we've got 40 year highs in inflation rates. So that's put us in a situation that we haven't really seen before in, in this country. And you can see how the inflation rate reacted. When the Fed stimulus started at the end of 2020, or the middle of 2020, the inflation rate was around negative a half percent a month. So it was running at essentially price stability. And you can see that dotted line across the, the, the graph is the Fed inflation target. Well, the money printing starts in March of 2020. The Fed package hits in the middle of 2020, and almost with a couple of months lag, the inflation rate picked up, and it was, it was running at about a percent a month, so 12 to 15 percent annualized. When the Fed decided let's let's stop this and pull back on both the stimulus and also the quantitative easing approach, which they had been doing at the Federal Reserve. So the inflation rate is now moderated. So that's that's the really good news, but it's still running a little bit hot, a little bit above target. And I think it could take a while in order for it to, to play out. And if you look at now what this, where this sets us up in terms of history, here's a chart that shows inflation rate on, on the y-axis and the economic growth on the x-axis. And I've just charted all the kind of post-World War II periods in economic history to show you where, where we end up, you know, where we are now, which is kind of a high inflation, low GDP growth, top left of the curve, top left of the, the quadrant period. That is very different from what most investors have experienced, because if you are about my age or maybe a little bit younger and you're hanging out at Art Basel in Miami today, you probably got most of your investing lessons in one of these green boxes. You either learned how to invest in like the mid 2000s when the growth rate was two to three percent GDP and we had low and kind of steady inflation, or you got your your uh, your brutal hard knocks lesson in 2008, 2009, or the first half of 2020, which would have been um, probably not a great lesson because the lesson would have been that everything you invest in goes down and goes down by a lot. And if you had the misfortune of graduating in like 2007 and got a job on Wall Street, I guess, in 2008, you probably had a really miserable start to your career. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry if the lesson was to lose faith in investing and lose faith in capitalism and I don't know, maybe you're still an investment banker, maybe you're not, maybe you're like teaching gym someplace and you're very happy. And I hope that's the case, but those are probably not the right lessons for most investors. A lot of you probably cut your teeth in those 2010 to 2019 periods of, of moderate to relatively healthy economic growth, low volatility and low inflation. What you've never done is had to invest in one of these blue areas, which is kind of where we're at now. We had a period of inflation in the 60s and 70s really until the early 80s. Reasonably good economic growth, but very volatile. A lot of recessions embedded right in the middle of those things. And so a very different period than what you've ever had to experience. So if you're only looking to those last few years for your, your lessons in portfolio allocation and how to invest, it's probably not the same period that we're in now. And there are some differences in how assets perform in these different eras. So what I've done is I've just taken these different areas and chunked them up into six different periods in American history. And again, this kind of goes back to the uh, just the World War II period, the, the the Great Depression, and then World War II. On the very far left is a period from 28 to 41, where it was a period of deflation, reasonably good economic growth, although it was very very volatile, and um, prices were declining by an average of one percent a year. And I've also shown what asset classes performed the best and what their returns were over that period. So the winner in that period was for corporate bonds. The return would have been about 7%. Pretty good in, an, in, an, in a period when inflation is negative 1%, right? Fixed income by far was the best performer during this period. The S&P 500 is in green. You barely would have beaten inflation by the S&P 500. So not a, good, not a good period for stocks. The next period is the post-World War II era from 42 to 65. Low inflationary growth. Inflation was at the time around 3%. Growth was around 4% a year, so a healthy, 
um, long-term growth average, the winner by far is stocks. You want to be in equities. The, the S&P 500 returns 16.6% during this period. Long-term bonds are only 2%. So the, the best possible long-term bond trader, uh, the Dan Marino, the Don Shula of U.S. Treasury bond investing, would have not been anywhere close to the worst possible equity investor. Like a passive equity index strategy would have won all day long during that period. So portfolio allocation really, really matters. It determines really how well you how well you do as an investor. And in this case, passive U.S. equity was the right bet. Well, this is the interesting one now. The inflationary period from 66 to 82. Stocks and bonds perform about the same. The, the green S&P 500 is about 8% year over year. Treasuries are about 7%. Corporate bonds about 6%. So fixed income and, and equities now are about performing the same. And this is where a lot of lessons about the, the ideal portfolio allocation get cemented into what financial planners now tell you, which is 60-40, equity fixed income and a lot of the a lot of the research and scientists science is really born out of these these investing periods um, note that oil and gold so uh, i'm trying to come up with the commodities and some commodities are tricky to define so i just decided on a 50 50 basket of oil and gold commodities do the best by far and just let's put a pin in that one and 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 just consider that that kind of conforms with your intuition that commodities should go up in an inflationary period and so maybe that's where you want to put your money and that certainly worked the last time around. But put, put a pin in that because I want to come back to it. Next period is the, next, is the, uh, the 80s and 90s. Low inflationary growth. Again, stocks do really, really well. Fixed income doesn't do very, very well. Commodities do terribly. So again, conforming with intuition in these low inflationary growth periods, you want to be in stocks all day long. Well, 2000, 2010 is a, a kind of a deflationary period. The inflation rate actually was a, a couple percent a year. It wasn't quite a um, classic deflation. But there's some issues with how the government keeps the inflation rate, um, particularly around real estate and how that gets reported. And I think it kind of overstated the, the uh, inflation rate for the time. Really, it was deflation-like. And note that during this period, again, fixed income does really well. Equities do really poorly. Um, oil and gold does really well. Why is that? So our intuition from the last, what the last conversation was during inflation, commodities should go up. During deflation, they should go down, right? They got punished during the 1930s and 40s deflation. So what, what happened? Basically, what happened with oil was it benefited tremendously from emerging market demand. And China, kind of the BRIC countries broadly, but China specifically. Um, it turns out that commodities, especially like food and wheat and, and even oil and gas and minerals, they kind of do their own thing. They're not really determined by broad macro inflationary or deflationary environments, at least not, not completely. Certainly, it's an effect, but not the only effect. So that's an interesting lesson. And then the last period, again, we kind of know what's happened. Equities have done really well. Fixed income's done really poorly. And so the lesson for most of you is that you want to be in equities, you want to be passive long, index funds will be active managers, and so on and so on and so forth. And that's where a lot of your intuitions probably sit in terms of the, the uh, where to put your money. So now if you think about where do you, where do you invest on a go forward basis, I would say the passive US equity strategy, which worked for the last four decades, really, probably not going to generate the same returns that it has. And so if your lessons have been around US passive equity, that's, that's not going to help you in the next few years. Why is that? Because the last four decades were really about beta, meaning if you just rode that S&P 500 kind of green passive equity bubble, you would have done great. You didn't have to beat the market to generate great returns. But the multiples right now that we're seeing in the US at least are quite rich. We're still more expensive than we have traditionally been. In fact, if you look at the S&P 500 PE multiple as of today, it's about 21 times earnings. And that's about about the average over the last 60 years. It's not, you know, not expensive, but it's not cheap either. And when you're investing in a market that is not expensive and not cheap, you can look and look back at history and look at your go forward returns. And it turns out that's what I've done here. <clears throat> when you invest in the market and you are in uh, in that middle to maybe top quartile PE ratio, your go forward returns are somewhere in the high single digits based on historical precedent. So if, that, if you're okay with low single-digit or mid-single-digit earnings and returns, that's probably not a bad strategy. A year ago, the PE 500, the S&P 500 multiples were right at the top of that historical observation list. We were in the top 2%, top 1% of all observations ever recorded. And when you invest in the markets that expensive, it would be negative. So 
if you invested at the top of the market last year, your expectation should be that returns are going to be negative. I think right now where we're at is they should be positive, but probably mid to high single digits. So going back to our little cheat sheet, it seems like passive U.S. equities are not a bad investment, but not a great investment. Fixed income. During certain periods of uh, inflation, we have seen fixed income do okay. The yield coupons right now that are being offered in U.S. Treasuries are still kind of low. We're only at four percent right now on the long bond, the ten, the ten and thirty-year bonds. Inflation's at seven percent plus. So investing and in locking in a four percent rate of return to me doesn't seem like a great strategy either. And I think we will see higher interest rates and better entry points on a go-forward mm -hmm. basis. Um, what else? Real estate. Uh, maybe you have to be careful now. The, the U.S. for the first time in 150 years is seeing a flat or even shrinking population in certain key states. Not not Florida, not like you guys, but California and New York. New York's been shrinking for the last 20 years. California for the first time ever shrank last year. And so as certain regions see an exodus of people and, and other regions see a benefit, um, that's going to play out on the uh, on the uh, the overall price of real estate. Um, also, just be aware of rising interest rates and then record low affordability, at least in, in certain parts of the country. I think alternatives could be really interesting in the next decade because the, this forward decade will be about alpha, not, not beta. What does alpha mean? It means uncorrelated returns. It means figuring out ways to beat the market using value investing and cash flows as opposed to just riding a, a market wave. So we could see interesting alternatives in things like hedge funds, things like private equity, venture capital. I'll give a little self-serving commercial on our side. What we have done is um, in the in the venture asset class, we've decided we think there's a lot of value in the space. We think we can buy great companies at 30 to 70 percent discounts to fair value. Very opportunistic, going after certain categories that we think are are really interesting and market favorable, buying it from funds that are illiquid and investors who need liquidity and creating alpha by finding these kinds of discounts. I think that is a that is a interesting strategy to beat the market, and that's something you're going to have to do. You can't just rely on beta anymore. This has got to be about alpha, alpha creation, and alpha producing investments in order to in order to really generate the desired returns over the next decade. All right. With that, let me just stop and see if there are any any questions. I can talk about a couple of a couple of other things, but I want to just love to hear. If any thoughts from the group? Doesn't look like we have any right at the moment. Okay. So let me take you through one other. While folks are doing their uh, their thoughts together, let me get you through one other one other thought. There is a there is an intuition around venture and private equity in particular that these tend to be highly correlated to equity strategies, right? That where the, where the stock market goes, the venture and private equity categories will go as well. It, that has always struck me as a little bit, little bit weird. Like why is it that venture as an asset class should correlate with, with uh, large cap equities? And it seems to me like venture is really a bet on innovation and in particular on software. And those things don't necessarily correlate with the, you know, the broader economic situation. In fact, if you look at the large cap equity index indexes now, there's a lot of consumer products, a lot of financial services and oil and gas. Why is it that software and venture would be correlated with those things? It's not, not intuitively clear that's been, that's been the case. For the last eight or 10 years, a lot of the research coming out has shown that these asset classes are correlated. And that has, I think, been a function of just a broader macro environment where a lot of assets have become correlated. But in the last couple of years, we've begun to see a break. This is some new research that I can I can cite and a few papers coming out that are showing realized returns in venture and comparing that over the last seven, eight years with these other asset classes. And it turns out that over the last couple of years, we've seen venture become very uncorrelated. Actually, it's almost no correlation, maybe even a negative correlation to large cap equity. And, and that, which seems to be more of what I would expect. And so as you think about it, this is just a chart showing venture capital and, and the different asset classes on the left and then across the top and the correlations between each of them. So venture to large cap equity has a, like a minus 0 0.06 uh, correlation now. Private equity, where a lot of the valuations kind of do ride with the S&P 500 or the broader indices, that is showing some correlation. But if you're looking at these other asset classes, venture increasingly looks like its own, its own thing. Real estate and, um, and venture and other alternative classes becoming uh, really dependent on the drivers of that specific industry rather than some of the macro factors. Mm -hmm. So 
as you're considering these asset classes, it's worth thinking about correlation between them to understand your own portfolio risk. <clears throat> All right. Any uh, any questions now or no? Seems seems now. Yeah, we have one coming. Okay. Hey, I'm on. You might not be able to see me, but it's Kayla. Yeah. How are you doing? Hey, how are you? Uh, it's kind of a softball one, but you talked about the fair market valuations and buying discounts. How are you guys yeah. looking at fair market valuations today? How do how do we how do we think about the valuations? I, you know, it's in, in venture or just in in general. In venture, very strategy. Yeah, I think we're seeing. Um, there's been a uh, a uh, slow kind of gradual, uh, you know, reset in these valuations. Where we, what we've seen in the public markets is a pretty rapid, uh, obviously pretty rapid correction. So, like year year to date, the S and P 500 is uh, down what about you know 17 18 percent year to date the nasdaq's down about 28 percent year to date so you would think that the 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 uh the valuations in a lot of these sectors ought to be down at least that much um wcld and and the bessemer cloud index are down closer to 50 percent year to date we have not seen the private valuations reset that much so some of the companies have done it voluntarily some of them have started to do some down rounds and restructurings where they will take that kind of a haircut um, a lot of them are just holding cash and trying to put off any financings and any any valuations, and they'll probably just hang out as long as they as long as they can and not take the the pain of a down round. If they don't have to raise money, they won't raise money. Um, I think at the end of the year we'll see some additional refinancings and then some audit adjustments that will begin to move the market closer to where the public markets are. Uh, it may take another year or so before this all flows through. I do think eventually we'll see the private market valuations. Um, either either go down and adjust fully um, or most of the way, or you know companies will just grow into their valuations. And so if you can if you can hold out for two years, I guess, and grow your business by two to three x, and uh, and then do another financing at a at the last round, you've in effect run into your valuation. And I think a lot of you know, a lot of really good companies will will do that. So that's my suspicion is we'll see a lot of that activity, but it won't be for another you know nine to twelve months before it kind of fully fully adjusts good question do you do valuations of uh lp interests in like that stone yeah yeah we we do we do a lot of that underwriting when we when we think about these valuations for what's in a lp interest we'll look at the underlying companies we'll do a kind of a re-underwriting of the portfolio um, on a sum of parts basis. What does the company, what does the LP really own? What are those companies really worth at today's valuations? And and then um, using public market comps or, or just our intuition around the cash flows of the business, what do we think it's it's really worth? And that's the only way to do this kind of private secondary stuff is you have to be thinking about the underlying pieces of the companies and and uh, and how they perform specifically to do it to do it right. And how many days do you need to make those kind of valuations? Usually the bidding period is not that long. Yeah, if you get to a competitive process, I mean, usually to go through a, a portfolio of uh, of companies, you 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 may only end up with three to five companies driving the majority of the value. That's the power law effect. That's the um, dynamic of you can start with a hundred companies that are in a private portfolio over a five or ten year period. Maybe only five of those one hundred really drive ninety nine percent of the value and and will return the fund or not. So you kind of want to focus on the five that really matter, not the 95 that don't. Um, it might just be a few days or, or a week of research to, to get a, um, an intuition or an angle around those companies, channel checking with investors, talking to the founders, talking to other, um, other folks who know the space. It's probably, a, it can be a very efficient process. We try to stay out of the competitive deals. We, we will try to look for more customer bespoke deals that are from our network where we have a friendly GP who can share with us the financials and give us information in a um, in an expedited way. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Dual Glass, and I got a quick question about uh, uh, in the investing environment and the makeup of the Congress of the political environment, excluding yeah. the Fed. Yeah. What's your what's your question? What is the what do we how do we feel about the investing environment now? 
Uh, do you have any charts and uh, comparisons with the makeup of Congress, Republican, Democrat, and how that affects the investing environment? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I've done some some research on it. Um, I don't have anything at the ready, but I think it's it's it definitely appears that uh, the the best possible case in terms of the business policy or the fiscal policy, um, it seems to be like the uh, well. Let's go back. Let's go back and do a little bit of the uh, comparison, so we can. Um, I can I can point to you where my where my intuition is, and then we can talk about where that works or where that doesn't work. So when you go back and look at some of these successful periods of, uh, of investing history, the, um, the interesting one to remember was uh, kind of the two on the bottom, uh, the bottom right were the probably the best investing periods where we had uh, from 83 to 89 was a high growth period. We had another period in, um, the, in the early to mid 60s where there was very favorable fiscal policy. It, it turns out that the two presidents during those periods this is actually I'm realizing this as I talk it through and I didn't I didn't I didn't um, I didn't pre you know pre think this the two presidents were two different parties one was Ronald Reagan who may be my favorite president of all time the other one was John F Kennedy for most of that 61 to 65 period and he was maybe my second favorite president of all time so we have one Republican one Democrat uh, rhetoric of John about orientation on a, a peak of 91% in the 1950s under Eisenhower to 70% under under Kennedy. Uh, and so, you know, the fiscal policy of, of Kennedy and Reagan, I think, is probably very determinative of how those investing periods came out. Um, we've definitely had divided government during uh, during that early 60s period. It was unified government under the Democrats. Uh, and it turned out to be pretty pretty good in the 80s. It was in the 80s and 90s. It was divided government where um, you had a Republican president and a Democratic Congress, and then uh, a Democrat, Bill Clinton, who I think in retrospect was another great president, and then a Republican Congress. And so that that division of government and the fact that we had gridlock and and you know by hook or by crook we had um, a uh, restraint on fiscal spending. We had close to balanced budgets during those during the. Uh, in the 1990s, we did have balanced budgets that actually created a very favorable and uh, and stable interest rate environment. Um, I think for the current government, the way that, the way it shapes up, the new Republicans will be a lot more fiscally disciplined, um, and if no for no other reason than to create divided government and gridlock and defund some of the priorities of the other party. But you know, it is it is what it is, and I think there could be a uh, a favorable uh, fiscal position coming out of this next Congress over the next couple of years relative to where we. Where we have been the fed is definitely talking like you know they're talking a tough game they're acting a tough game and they're being very tight and disciplined so if they follow through on their um on their actions over the past six months which i expect that they would with political cover from the new house on um, sound money i think i think it will result in eventually uh low inflation fed target inflation again i don't know about you know the growth rate the growth rate in the economy has definitely slowed the last couple of decades and some of that is political, but some of that is just the the nature of the growth now has been, um, you know, if I take if I look at one big driver of growth and one one thing that has been a factor in both of those growth periods, um, it's labor force participation. The labor force participation rate in the um, in the in the early '60s was like 59 percent, and it it peaked uh, in the late 2000s at about 67 percent. So it's almost like if you have 10 players on a soccer team. Uh, I know you have nine players on a, you know, if 10 players, let's assume you have 10 players in the soccer team to make the math easy. You go, you have six active players up to seven active players. That that makes a big impact, right, on the effectiveness of that of that soccer team. If you have another another active player on the field, um, if you lose one player, like we kind of have over the last 15 years, we've gone from 67 percent labor force participation to the low 60s, and it hasn't rebounded. It's almost like getting a red card. What happens when you have a soccer team and one of you gets a red card? Like, how productive is that soccer team? And and do they keep scoring goals or do they start scrambling and trying to keep the ball out of the net? And that's I think kind of what's happened the last few years is we've we've lost ground on labor force participation. So lack of immigration, lack of key skills and key areas, and just the the population you know aging out means we have a bit of a, a drag on growth for the first time in a while. That's probably not as good. So you know it's kind of a that's a bit of a mixed bag and maybe a longer answer than you're expecting, but that's kind of what I think. Okay, come on. Thank you so much. Any final words for the audience here? 
No, I wish I was out there with you. Thank you very much for uh, for having me. It's uh, great to talk to you as always, and hope we'll see you next year.